Hiya! Welcome back to Manic Episodes. If you're one of the negative two people who watches these videos but doesn't follow my main show, you should know that I've been discussing the Tremors movies. So I don't feel like I need to explain this since I've been getting questions about it daily, but Tremors had a TV show. It's true! probably three camps for the series. People who loved it, people who never heard of it, and people who think it got Farscape cancelled. Let me put this rumor to rest. Tremors the TV series did not get Farscape off the air, it was the other way around. The Sci-Fi Channel has this horrible habit of screwing over every success it's ever had, and these shows are no exceptions. The Tremors show was in production before Farscape was cancelled, but once that show was given the boot, Tremors got the time slot. Despite it being their highest rated show at the time, it didn't make the same views Farscape did, and it was cancelled mid-season. Yes, it's a bunch of BS, especially when you hear the plots that were coming up later in the season. It would have been freaking awesome! But what we got was pretty cool too. I'll go over all of the episodes here in order, let you know what we missed out on, and sum up what I thought. Forgive me if some of the descriptions are quick, I'll only comment on the ones I feel need expanding on. So let's get started. Here's the overview. This was made in 2003 and follows the events of the third movie, meaning El Blanco is still living in perfection and protected as an endangered species. Bird is our main character, once again played by Michael Gross, Jody and Nancy are back, played by different actresses, there's Tyler Reed replacing Jack as the tour guide dude, Rosalita, a relative of Miguel's who's taking care of the ranch, and Twitchell, a government agent that lets them live there while keeping an eye on El Blanco. There's also this long-haired Native American guy who I forgot was even in the show. I'm not sure who he was. The short version of the plot is, they blow up monsters and shit. And here we go. Feeding Frenzy kicks things off by introducing Tyler Reed, who has moved to Perfection Valley to continue the tour guide business left behind by Desert Jack. He used to be a race car driver, and the show is under the mistaken belief that driving fast is an actual skill. It's not really clear why they decided to make him a new character since they just recast Jody and Nancy, but I guess I didn't really care if Jack left anyway. They have a throwaway line about it not working out between Jack and Jody, and that's about the last bit of personality you will ever see in Jody here. Anyway, Tyler has come to perfection just as a hiker is killed by El Blanco. Bert rescues him and takes him back to town. Meanwhile, Melvin is still skulking around and wanting to buy out the place. He's the only other actor from the movies to return to the series. Oh, by the way, did some research on the parents thing? It turns out in the original script for the first movie, they explain that his parents abandoned him to gamble a lot, so that's part of why he hates the town so much. I'll buy it, and now you know about as much as I do about him. El Blanco is acting weird lately. Not the people eating, but, you know, weird for a graboid. It turns out a machine was set up to stimulate his hunger response, with the idea that the townsfolk would kill him and perfection would no longer be protected. You can guess who was behind this one. A little turd. It's not a bad pilot. The plot is pretty simple, so it gives us more time to be introduced to the characters. Next! Shriek and Destroy follows Bert and Tyler as they travel to an Arizona Pioneer Days celebration with a Shrieker problem. For whatever reason, Sci-Fi didn't like this episode and changed the airing order so this one was last, but I don't really get that. The thing that I liked about the series was when they took the monsters to a different environment, when they did things out of Bert's comfort zone. Setting this at a Pioneer Days festival was pretty fun, and seriously, the ending of this episode is one of the crowning moments for the show. Bert actually makes an army out of a baseball team to kill Shriekers. How did Sci-Fi not think that was awesome? Forget Mega Gator vs. Octoshark, Baseball Team vs. Shriekers. Yes. So, uh, an Ass Blaster does return for one episode. You're welcome. And look, I liked the third movie, but the plot of this episode is just stupid. 
The ass blaster in this is the one Nancy sold to Siegfried and Roy. Oh, sorry, Sigmund and Ray. Yeah. Look, you said their names in the movie. You can't go back now. Anyway, she's feeling guilty because the ass blaster that she sold is killing people, and yeah, maybe she should. Because that was a horrible idea. But it does give us a nice character moment, and gives the series a little more depth than just that show where they blow up the monsters. Maybe it's okay. No, We're... it's not okay, Bert. Two people have died. You couldn't have known. Well, I should have known, Bert. <laughs> Uh, uh, look, will you listen to me? Nancy, this isn't your fault. I don't blame you. Nobody blames you. Just trying to pay your daughter's tuition. I'm trying to be a good mother. <laughs> this is also the episode they introduced Bert's survival school in, an on-off job that he has throughout the series. It is kind of funny to see everyone try to distract his students while Bert investigates the ass blaster, but it's not like it's a secret what Bert does. They could just reschedule, you know. By the way, they solve the ass blaster problem with French cuisine. And they wear silly heat protection ponchos. So that's pretty cool. Well, there you go, Bert. You're the Martha Stewart of whatever it is you do. The next episode is the first of two plots centered around some Vegas folks who come to perfection. One of the guys wants to convince his friend that Graboids exist and ends up being eaten by El Blanco, but unfortunately he had a key on him for a bunch of cash they'd stolen. The other guy, played by John Turturro's brother, brings back his boss to take down El Blanco, things go wrong, and it's assumed that he's eaten. Spoiler alert, he's not. But other than that, this episode isn't terribly noteworthy. Also, worst green screen ever. So remember when I said sci-fi changed the airing order? Well, this is all sorts of messed, which is a big problem because there is some continuity to follow here. Case in point, they had to reshoot footage for this next episode to have it make any sort of sense, since it has characters and plot elements that were already introduced, but this was the first time we were supposed to have seen any of them. This intro sequence was kept on the DVD, but in the proper production order, which still leaves people with questions since the new footage includes characters we haven't been introduced to yet. It's terribly confusing. Okay, here's how it goes. The framing device begins with Tyler telling Larry about when they first met Dr. Cletus Poffenberger. Who's Larry? Who's Dr. Poffenberger? Well, poo, guess they should have just aired it in order, huh? Alright, Larry is an annoying tourist who eventually moves to perfection. That's all you need to know about him. Dr. Poffenberger is a crazy guy on the outskirts of town, played by Christopher Lloyd. He's pretty awesome, because hey, Christopher Lloyd. Cletus used to work for the government, and they did experiments with a dangerous chemical called Mixmaster, which basically made hybrids of any living thing save for human beings. That means they created new creatures out of several plants and animals. One such creature, Project 412, escapes from Cletus's house and starts killing people. And I know we're supposed to be scared of it, but it looks stupid. You can't tell me it doesn't. I'm also confused as to why no one knew about Cletus for so long. He apparently was close enough to watch everyone for years and follow their lives. That's actually pretty creepy. But more importantly, where was he when the Graboid and Ass Blaster attacks were going on? But whatever. Bert ends up taking out 412 with a blowtorch in classic Bert fashion. Not in my valley, you don't. And they end on this somewhat comical, bittersweet moment. I know 412 was up to no good, but he was the best. <laughs> I can't really describe why I like the scene, but I do. Cletus is a weird character, but you actually feel for him when he loses his silly rhino hybrid pet. Christopher Lloyd sold me on it. Speaking of which, we get a follow-up to that when Rosalita thinks she sees a ghost in an abandoned mine. Bert is convinced this has to do with the secret government lab Cletus used to work in. What we're dealing with here is obviously some diabolical water-absorbing agent that most likely had its genesis in our very own, long-abandoned, government-supported secret biotech laboratory. For God's sake, be rational. It turns out it's genetically engineered bacteria to remove moisture and food, so they bring in Cletus to help them out. 
He explains that the bacteria leaked out of the facility, but that also means that Mixmaster did as well, meaning that they're in for a whole slew of wild and wacky hybrid creatures in the valley. This was a good plot device. I like that they could fight all sorts of new monsters without making the graboids go stale. As for the bacteria, well, they suck it in with a vacuum. Ta-da! This is followed by Night of the Shriekers, the first of a handful of stupid environmental episodes that annoy me. I get why they centered plots around people who want to preserve the graboids, shriekers, and ass blasters, but it's really boring. It gets really preachy when it's supposed to mean something, and it gets tedious when you know the people are being stupid. Besides, you just want to see these things get destroyed. You don't want to debate about the preservation of nature or whatever. It's not going to mean much anyway. You wouldn't have a show if you couldn't blow these things up. So, whatever. Melinda Clark stops by with her genetically engineered shriekers, things go awry, she's eaten. It's an opportunity to make your place so much more attractive. Attracted to whom? Other people? Old friends dropping by, long lost relations showing up, an endless stream of overnight guests. Why don't I just open up a bed and breakfast? A Little Paranoia Among Friends is my favorite episode of the series. It takes the show to a new place, has some clever ideas, and was the best character-driven episode for me. People are disappearing in a little town in New Mexico, and Bert and Tyler are sent in to check it out. It's obviously a graboid attack, but the town is convinced their loved ones are being abducted by aliens. Bert has a rational response. Together they think aliens abducted their citizens. Uh, I know, and uh, the local paper says they're trying to communicate with them, which is what I want to talk to you about. You're all nuts! This causes a lot of clashing with the townsfolk, led by Armin Shimmerman in his 6,000th genre show appearance, who runs the local radio station. Despite Bert's hatred for the government, he and Tyler have to pretend to be agents to convince the town that the Graboids are the aliens and stop them from being eaten. I also liked when Rosalita sent to Bert's place to help them out, and we find out his password is Heather. Still holding on to the past, Albert. Huh, this episode has a good mix of humor and serious moments. Tyler and Bert really push each other's buttons, Bert pretending to be an agent is pretty hilarious, and you really feel for the people they're trying to help. The point of the whole thing isn't that they really believe in aliens, it's that they refuse to let go of the people they lost. It keeps the episode from being too silly, and I really dug it. Flora or Fauna takes us back to the Mixmaster plot and introduces us to some new characters. This is our real introduction to Larry, and you'll have to forgive me for not giving a poo about him. We also meet Dr. Casey Matthews and Roger Garrett, two scientists who are doing research in the area and serve as our Explain the Monster of the Week folks. The hybrid this time is a plant-slash-animal thing that spits acid, and our heroes have to stop it from spreading its seeds and dooming the world. Cletus returns for his last appearance to help them out, and once the monster is taken care of, he and Larry leave town. Hey, you guys in the old lab, you ever do experiments with time travel? Yeah, Christopher Lloyd's expression pretty much mirrors my thoughts on this. The episode probably has my favorite ending, though. Lobby. The next episode is another environmental one. You can probably guess how I feel about it. But it's also my least favorite episode because of how annoying it is. A group of picketers come to town to protest how El Blanco is being treated and cause a media circus, and among them is Nancy's daughter Mindy. Yes, she was in both attacks and nearly eaten several times, but she's part of the Save El Blanco camp. Also, she quit going to that school her mother paid for by selling that ass blaster, meaning the deaths it caused were entirely meaningless. And that's probably what annoys me the most about this episode. She seems entirely different to how we've previously seen her character. She's just being annoying and doing it for some guy she likes, and you can pretty much predict how it's all going to end. Mindy learns her lesson because the guy is a douche. It turns out one of the scientists was actually poisoning El Blanco, and they have to work together to save him. It'd be kind of touching if the rest of the episode weren't so obnoxious. Water Hazard sees the return of Melvin. He's created an artificial lagoon in Bixby, but he's stolen the water from the valley because he's cheap. This information is provided to us by Patrick Swayze's brother. Unfortunately, the water brought another creature with it. And this is probably my favorite hybrid on the show because of how silly it is. You ready for this? It's a giant shrimp. Yes, a giant killer shrimp. That's fantastic. 
Also, it's got Bobby from Supernatural in it, fighting said giant killer shrimp. You can't get much better than that. Bert has sort of a diminished role in this episode, which is a little bit of a bummer because this is his last one. Yeah, they were filming Tremors 4 at the time, and the show was cancelled mid-season, so Bert isn't in the last two. But this episode is still pretty good. It features Tyler in a more prominent role, and has a lot of great Melvin moments. I have rights. As a businessman, as an American. Well, as an American, I'm sure you want to do what's best for everyone. No, I don't. I'm gonna skim over the last two episodes because they lack Bert and don't contribute too much to the series. They're still pretty solid episodes, but there's nothing terribly noteworthy in them. Second to the last episode, Larry annoys people and their flesh-eating bugs. The last episode features Vivica A. Fox and Nick Turturro returns as they try to retrieve the key El Blanco swallowed. The very last scene is of Larry looking through graboid poop and finding it. You're welcome. Okay, so before I talk about my overall thoughts on the show, you should know what the series was going to become. Get this, Val and Earl were going to come back. I don't know about Kevin Bacon, but I do know Fred Ward was on board. In fact, he was going to be part of the series from the get-go, but he had to opt out because of other obligations. There was going to be a revelation that Rosalita was not who she said she was, and that would cause a lot of tension in the group. Bert and Nancy were going to attempt to get together, but ultimately, Bert isn't willing to let go of Heather, and the two decide to remain friends. Future plots would have involved an octopus that attacked from trees, more flying creatures, Bigfoot, vampires, and killer robots that look like toaster ovens. I'm so disappointed these ideas never came to fruition, you don't even know. Overall thought time, let's start with the characters. Jody is probably the weakest one, and the most disappointing part of the series. She usually stays in the background. It's like she went backwards from where she was in the third movie. Rosalita isn't as well developed either, but knowing the direction they wanted to take her character in does make a lot of her actions more telling in retrospect. They did a lot more with Nancy here than they did with her in the movies, and she had her moments to shine. Tyler was great as our everyman, and he made a nice foil for Bert. I like the idea of Melvin being a villain, and as much as I give him shit, he's a character I love to hate. He's really funny in the series. They don't overuse him, and you love to see bad things happen to him. Twitchell was also a nice source of conflict, and he was pretty funny to watch. Bert is great as always, though they have a tendency to have him overuse the same quotes, but it doesn't take away from how awesome he is. They manage to add to his character without taking away what makes him cool. So how does the Tremor show hold up? Pretty darn well, actually. It's a lot better than the third and fourth films, and it uses its time well to expand upon the Tremors universe. You never feel like it gets too serious or too goofy, the guest stars are usually solid, and it has a lot of nifty ideas. The Mixmaster plot opened up more possibilities to keep things interesting, and the creature designs were a lot of fun. I think a bit of bad timing and horrible scheduling ultimately did the show in, but it didn't have anything to do with the quality of the program. We may never get to see the rest of the show, but I can tell you that what we did get was solid. If you're a fan of the movies, you'll dig this. And now you've been supplied with critical, need-to-know information. You better 